Hey guys, so I just came out here to start planting my green stock. Uh, the other day I was at the farmer's co-op and I picked up a couple, uh, six packs of some starts. I've got some uh, red romaine lettuce here. And I picked up some other red leaf lettuce called Red Sails. And look what happened to it. I didn't plant it soon enough and Edith found it. I had it sitting up here on the porch on my bench. And uh, Edith is our goose. Uh, she just kind of roams the, roams the property with her companion, Duck. <laughs> uh, Duck and Edith. And uh, she discovered my lettuce. Um, yeah, so it looks like it's trying. I mean, even the ones she ate down, I've got, there's like little baby leaves right there. So, uh, hopefully they'll recover. And then I also picked up something else. Picked up some celery. I have never grown celery before. I don't know if it will grow well in a green stock, but... We'll give it a try. So one of the things that I did this year for my green stock is I got a, it's kind of like a Lazy Susan. It's a metal platform on wheels so that I can actually rotate this. So last year I had a really hard time um, keeping my green stock here um, moist but I had it out in the garden area where it was full sun all day long it may have just been too much um, for our Alabama summers I don't know so I moved it up here to the porch it still gets a ton of sunlight I mean the porch roof is just it's right here so it's you know got a lot of sun already and in the afternoon, the sun is over this way. So there's going to be a ton of light up here. So I'm hoping that this will work out a little bit better. You know, people have fantastic success with these green stalks. And I don't know, I think I just didn't spend enough time figuring it out last year. So hopefully it works better for me this time around. I'm actually going to take my little tag and stick it in one of the cells here. That way I can remember which kind I planted, which kind this is. So the other day, I posted in the Facebook group um, that I was waiting on the FedEx guy and I said, any guesses on what I'm expecting? A lot of guesses on baby chicks. Nope, <laughs> no baby chicks. Uh, I am not, not adding any chicks to the flock this year. Um, maybe next year. Uh, at this point, I've got I've got a good flock and I'm getting lots of eggs so uh, and I just added the Icelandics this past fall so um, that's kind of like my new my new version this year so the package I was waiting on was actually beehives but what I didn't realize when I ordered them is that the beehives do not come assembled. They are in about a million pieces. <laughs> or at least that's what it sure looks like. So, um, that was a little bit of an unexpected big project because from what I read, it takes at least four hours 
to put one of these hives together. <clears throat> and I ordered two. So I'm just going to wait for a rainy day when there's no good reason to be outside, which might be tomorrow. I don't know. We'll just have to see. And uh, do it on a day when I can't be outside. <laughs> Sip of my coffee. So I have been ordering everything that I need for the bees. Now I don't know when exactly I'm going to add them, like the actual bees, but I've been working on getting everything that I need for them because honestly, bee equipment, all the stuff that you need, it kind of adds up. Um, the hives themselves are a little pricey, the um, suit, a little pricey, and so I've just kind of been gradually adding, um, so I've just been kind of gradually getting everything that I would need so that when I am ready to um, start the apiary, I'll have everything I need to do so. Um, it might be, it may be this year, maybe next year. It, it just really is going to depend upon um, really when I feel ready to get started with those and when I for sure have everything that I could possibly need. I don't know if you just heard that buzz. Um, there was just a hummingbird right here, like right next to the camera. Ooh, so that is the first time I've seen one. Mr. Smith said he saw one the other day. I need to get my hummingbird feeder out. That's exciting. Boy, if that doesn't tell you garden season is, is like on the cusp, I don't know what does. Hummingbirds. All right. So let me kind of spray this off and clean off all that dirt. All right, so I have these all planted, my two different varieties of lettuce and some celery in there. Again, I don't know if that'll grow well in there, but why not, right? So what I will do is, since I do have this up here on the porch and you know I'll be coming through and watering it on a regular basis, uh, what I'll do is every time I water I'll just kind of rotate the stalk since I have it on my wheeled platform and everything and then um, all of the plants will get a rotation of sunlight. Maybe I can even do it um, well, no, I'm not going to say I'm going to do it twice a day because I know myself. I'll forget. So just every time I water, I'll come and like give it a half turn and yeah, we'll see how it goes this time. I don't have the bottom cells planted yet. Uh, not sure what I'm going to plant down there. Not sure what Edith won't eat. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem with having a goose and letting her free roam the property. But quite frankly, um if I put her inside a fenced area, she could fly right over it anyways, and I'm not going to clip her wing. She's just, she's too big. Um, we just kind of let her do her thing, and Duck follows her wherever she goes. So you may remember last year, I was invited by a local family to uh, come to their home. They had bought their property around the same time we bought ours here, but one of the amazing traits of their property was an established blueberry grove. This grove was is well over 20 years old because I know because I went back and looked at satellite photos from Google Earth and looked at the archived images trying to figure out how old they were and I did that because I wanted to have an idea of how long it would take for something like that to become established. Uh, yeah, it took a, it, it took a long time. Uh, but anyways, they invited me to come and dig up some baby blueberry plants because 
you know, with this established grove, they had all of these offshoots and, and these seedling plants that were just all over the place. And they told me, you know, obviously these varieties grow well here. And if you want, you can come dig some up. So I did that, I brought some back, I potted them up. I have several of them growing in my, um, in my raised bed that I built over there to kind of create a little blueberry hedge. And the other thing I got while I was there was some raspberry plants, little itty bitty seedling things. Well, oh, I got mail. All right, so before I show you the raspberries, uh, let me show you what just came in the mail. Live beneficial insects refrigerate upon arrival. I decided that this year I was going to preemptively get a start on pest control in the garden. Um, about a week or two before I really started planting, I want to treat all of the soil with beneficial nematodes. And so I went online, I ordered, it's kind of like the triple threat, I think it was called, from Arbico Organics. If you are not familiar with them, when it comes to pest control, they are such a fantastic resource. I first learned about them years ago when we lived in North Carolina because I had a raised bed garden in my backyard on my patio with tons of self-watering pots. Self-watering pots have standing water in them. Standing water is a breeding ground for mosquitoes. And I found um, a treatment, completely natural, totally safe, that you can put where you have standing water and it stops mosquitoes and it's fantastic and so that is how i learned about them you can go on their website you can order praying mantises ladybugs if you want to be able to control pests naturally in your garden or your property anywhere you need to check them out not a sponsor post or anything but an excellent resource so i'm going to go stick these in the fridge and then i will show you the raspberry plants Okay, so raspberries. When I dug them up, they were like little bitty three inch seedlings, I guess you would call them. And look, these things are about ready to plant. So the other day I picked up a couple of those um, old castle landscaping blocks that I used to make those easy like five minute raised beds. I'm not gonna do like a, a really high raised bed, but raise it up just enough so that it can drain out a little bit. But I'm gonna go ahead and start a raspberry one. I've got several um, from those seedlings that I had uh, dug up and potted. You can see this one's even got, got blossoms on it. So, these are going to be getting planted. I've got, um, I think I've got about six of them. And so I think that will be an excellent start to a raspberry hedge. Yes, so that'll be one of the projects uh, coming up this week. And, uh, oh, let me show you something else. Check this out. So this great big pot is just soil from last year. It was something that I had, something I had grown flowers in and it's just been sitting there all winter. Well, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I went out and I trimmed all of the little offshoots from the bottoms of my apple trees. And instead of just throwing them off into the woods or the compost, I thought, you know what? Let's just stick them in some dirt and see what happens. You guys, there were no leaves and they're actually trying to grow in this old depleted soil. So this will be another project, um, probably today. I'm going to get out some good soil and actually properly pot these 
I mean, I just stuck them in the dirt and they're growing. So uh, I might have a bunch of free apple trees unexpectedly, but I'm definitely not going to complain. And this is just one of the pots. I've got, you can see a super tall one right over there past the uh, butterfly bush. But yeah. So if they grow roots as easily as they have grown their leaves, it looks like I'll have a bunch of free apple trees. Of course, I don't know what varieties they are. Um, I mean, I know what kinds I have out here, but I didn't label my sticks. <laughs> so it'll just be apple trees if they do grow. So there was a video clip at the very end of my last video where you could see um, Edith and Duck inside the cattle panel house here. And this cattle panel house, I have a, a blog post where I talk about how I construct this thing, but I designed it to be movable so that I could put it wherever I wanted to. I could move it around, fresh ground, things like that. Um, I, I kind of did the legs of it or the, the base of it, sort of like skids. It's been sitting here for the past several weeks with some roosters in it because as you know, I hatched out some Icelandic roosters and once they got to a certain age, um, four roosters with four hens was not a good situation. That was entirely too much. So we went through and we looked at um, the different roosters, we looked at their temperaments, and we picked the one that we thought would probably be the best one um, for our little Icelandic flock of five. Then we went in at night while they were all sleeping, we gathered up the other three and we put them in here. Um, I posted them in a, a local forum for poultry and all three of them went to new homes but I do still have the cattle panel house sitting here uh, Edith and Duck like to go in there they're actually in there right now because I can hear Duck talking and I can kind of see them there through through the window that sits there um, and actually you can probably hear them as well but uh yes so officially we are down to five icelandics they are still in the original coop they have their own run area i mean it's not huge but once we get around to finishing this fence and putting in permanent fence i will expand it make it a little bit bigger they're still going to have their own area um, because with them being such a rare breed I don't want their genetics to um, mix with the other chickens. I would like to still keep them separate so that at some point when I decide to incubate uh, more Icelandic eggs or if say I have an Icelandic hen go broody and she wants to hatch some out herself, then I will know that they are just straight Icelandic chickens. I don't want to... Um, dilute the breed since it is so rare so quick little update on the Icelandics and now that um, the cattle panel house is empty once we are fully dried out here I will grab the tractor bring it over here hook up some straps to the little um, u-bolt thingies that I attached there and I will just drag it over to a different location and kind of get it out of the way so I spent a lot of time today cleaning out uh, garden beds, raised beds, mixing up my solution for fire ants, and have been going all over the property dealing with fire ant mounds, especially in my raised beds. Um, I had several people asking me about what I use to get rid of fire ants, and I have a video where I talked all about it. I kind of experimented with it, and I shared exactly how I made that. I also have it in print form on my website, and so the video and the, the article are in the same location. I will put a link to those down below.
Now, it's not as effective as, say, pesticides, but since I'm using it in my garden, I don't want to use things like that, and so sometimes you got to give it more than one application, especially if it is a super deep, uh, massive fire ant mound. Um, sometimes it just takes more than one try to get them all, but it works very well. And generally, once I have obliterated a fire ant mound in one of my garden beds, um, it's usually good for the whole season. Usually around winter time, they kind of start working their way back in. Um, so it's just, I have found something that I've got to do every spring. Um, but once they're gone in the spring, I'm usually good for the garden season. You can probably tell I'm losing light, so I will wind this up. So thanks for joining me out here at the homestead. My name is Constance from Cosmopolitan Cornbread, and I'll talk to y'all next time.